okay uh, hello everyone uh, very good morning and uh, again a warm welcome to our ninth interview in this uh, series which is titled as shades of green this is going to be our ninth and uh, culminating interview the final interview that we are going today in this series and uh, it has been a fantastic journey so far i mean we we had an opportunity to talk to eight diverse kind of a people and today also we are going to talk to a very fascinating practice and the kind of discoveries that we have managed to do as a result of this series is uh, is has actually widened our own understanding of what does the word sustainability mean in the context of uh, built environment and uh, different architects different organizations have been interpreting this in their own ways and uh, we have also been trying to uh, publish the gist of these interviews in the form of these articles and uh, you can see the whole database of all these various approaches getting built up slowly as a kind of a very interesting archive that one can go and visit any time uh for today's interview which is going to be our culminating interview i am really really delighted to share that we are going to talk to a practice from bangalore who who brings together diverse kinds of approaches that we have actually talked about throughout this series on one hand they have been uh, exploring the alternative materials alternative technologies the earth construction and so there is one whole section that deals with the architectural object but the firm's philosophy doesn't stop at just producing the architectural object but they go a step further and look at that particular architectural object as a rooted in the larger ecological issues where they also bring in the issues related with the water management i'm talking about bio environmental solutions from bangalore and uh, i would like to welcome chitra vishwanath and the team from the bio for uh, for this interview chitra welcome uh, to this uh, series can i have your own videos please thank you ayas and thank you akidaris for this opportunity Oh, and I'm quite surprised this is the final interview so it's i hope we do the best and uh, it's also our honor to share the space with sandeep a good friend of ours so i'm starting to share the screen can you just give me a few minutes i'll introduce uh, uh, the bio also and i'll also uh, introduce the talk the gist of the talk that you are going to give me just take 2 minutes i won't be long uh i'm as chitra has already mentioned we are we are having today uh, sandeep birmani from hunar shala kutch and i'm really delighted to share that we are having him again in this series we already had one interview with him in this series and uh, sandeep bhai welcome uh, again on this series it's good to see you back thank you and uh, so uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce bio uh, the, and the talk that they are going to give and also please uh, i have already introduced sandeep bhai in this series but please allow me to introduce him as well about bio environmental solutions bio environmental solutions is a multidisciplinary firm working on ecological designs its multidisciplinarity springs from the coming together of architects and people from various professions with keen interest and passion to work on ideas of water the architecture part of bio began in 1991 as chitra vishwanath architects and water began in 2000 as rain water club started by chitra and vishwanath respectively in 2008 they merged and became bio the dictionary meaning of bio is the ecology of a place bio to date has designed about 700 architectural projects of various scales and is also involved with ideas on water from the household level to the national level biome water 
as it is called also advise on policy level decisions to the government about uh, today's talk uh, at biome we feel that the practice of architecture in the era of anthropocene should go beyond space making and encompass more of the issues concerning the environment this can be done only when multi disciplines and interests come together the talk is a conversation between the team biome and what makes it a biome the team will also chat about how biome engaged itself during the lean days of the pandemic with its book and the archive project uh, i would also like to briefly introduce uh, sandeep bhai uh, sandeep birmani is an environmentalist with training in architecture based in kutch over the past 30 years he has been working with communities all over india celebrating their traditional knowledge in water management food production animal breed and seed conservation building with natural materials and wildlife conservation he has set up two organizations hunarshala foundation to work on build habitats and sahajeevan to work on ecosystems and her indigenous communities he has recently begun writing stories and painting uh i'm really really glad to have all of you here on this uh, platform and uh, chitra i would like to hand it over to you uh for the presentation please uh, can we have your presentation thank you thank you ayas yeah so i repeat again thank you ayas and aki diaries for this opportunity and it's really an honor for us to share the space with sandeep so our take of green sense is much to do with the materiality of our architecture and how our architecture folds in the contingency of water in the design and thinking and especially the water which is so much uh, of a crisis in our city so in this session we are talking as an interdisciplinary praxis what uh, i has introduced us as in the beginning so what i will do is to introduce the journey of the brown and then introduce my colleagues sharat and anurag who will share few projects which biome architecture is doing then shubha will talk about biome water and their engagements vishnath will sum up the whole presentation and we leave us and the listeners to sandeep's probes so that's the office left is the brown the architecture team and right is the water team and now it's a good mix um of people from various uh, professions especially in water in architecture it's mostly architects and engineers and also all the other helping professionals who make the whole team and we have also started uh, training one fellow quite young he's in the pink there sitting our architectural journey began in 1991 learning a lot from baker and in instead of science on the left is one of the homes where baker's idea of a uh, rat trap bond is mixed with the uh, the work happening at in instead of science civil engineering department and combined the two on the right is one purely baker home and which was very important for the scientists from isro that who came from kerala that he wanted to show his expressions and it had to be the baker home so these are homes for middle class mostly in the suburbs being economical being the writer of the design bakers and materiality and techniques were very much accepted by the middle class so we had to mostly follow that and at that time we were also much aware of only this material though we made beautiful spaces this is 5 year hence uh, one of the homes and uh, 
we remained unfulfilled because Bakerism then turned for us as an aesthetic and not always following his tenets of lowering the cost or of um, using local materials. So for us, the best opportunity came when we designed our own home. So I'm sitting in the basement of the home and uh, we could take the earth out from this basement and use it to build a bow designed for diurnal variations which would happen in Bangalore's climate. So a room designed with mezzanines, but smaller in area, but uh, larger in volumes, etc. where we could do all this here along with water harvesting, along with growing food, treating wastewater, and all of this in a small plot in the city. And this for us was the next step we took took to moving from economical constructions to ecological constructions. So this, what we learned in Sans Souci, which is our house where we integrated construction and water was taken further in an 80 acre land development where we study the hydrogeology, like what Sandeep talked about in Gutch, they did to study the way the water moves below underground and study the hydrology, study the various kinds of soils available in the land. And so looked at resources to build with, where will we dig for earth? We, we're quite, uh, engage with this whole idea as much as possible. Let's build with earth because it's closest to us. And this earth which we use is not burnt. So the kind of soil requirement and the way we would um, make the blocks are very important for us, the, com the combinations which we take. So in this plot of land, after studying the hydrogeology, we decided where will we dig? So we dug what you would see in the right hand corner in the northwest corner a hundred meter by hundred meter pond which gave us enough earth to continue building in this land and then through the hydrogeology we also in the in the bottom uh, the circle in the south where a well was dug which provides enough water for through throughout the year for this whole uh, site a site and for living here for about uh, almost 400 people now and here we brought in different ways of treating the wastewater all this together allowed us to look at this uh, whole site plan in an ecosystem way whereas uh, and to say this this all began with a small that is on our home so us, our learning was at our home and San Susi. So this is the structure. This is the structure at the Nico village now about 12 years old. So the design is amenable to the climate, which is composite and also where it rains 3000 mm in this rainy season in the monsoons. So here the whole idea was how do you engage with resources to build and we didn't really go far because we got it from the site itself. And that also engaged with the idea of resources to live by. And this idea of resources further now is engaging us with waste. We see so much of waste all around and we don't want to see waste as something you cannot use, but see waste as a to see buildings as waste sinks. So here is this office in, in uh, Bhopal, where the southwest corner was the space which was used for storing paper. And this had to happen because of the way the transportation happened and how the materials would come in. So it was this corner and it was really hot. Then we went to the Kabadiwalas in Bhopal and we found these louvers which were available for at a very low cost and we picked up this louvers and used it for shading the southwest corner of this building where the paper is stored. 
So moving on to now, this is our present uh, quite a bit of uh, obsession to work with waste. But moving on, besides the buildings being waste sink, can they be built in such a way that each of its component, the built component, can become a material to use later? So the building goes back as a as technical nutrient, and uh, it can be taken apart each one of it. So here you see the foundation is with stone uh, slabs and you could take that, them out. You don't have to break, you can reuse them. External facade is a mix of steel, aluminum, wood, glass, earth, and all of this can be reused. The columns are steel, again, butt welded, they can be removed. The partition walls are of of earth and um, paper tubes, which will go back to the earth. The false ceiling is bamboo. The roof is of GI sheets. And most interestingly, the flooring, which you would see here, completely inside too, is with paving tiles on quarry dust. So you can even remove the flooring without wasting, and you can get back the quarry dust and surely after five, 10 years, even quarry dust will be quite expensive in Bangalore. So this is how it looks inside. So I come to the last uh, slide here, which is how we were busy with during the, the lean times of COVID. We are working on our book, a book which is a compendium of essays, photographs, drawings, and I'll talk about what makes biome for us tick. We are also working on archives of our works. We lost a lot of drawings, um, which were hand-drawn drawings, but we luckily have a, we managed our digital drawings. So since we were rather not so busy, we have also gone and measured drawn our old structures because this is a 30 year old practice and it's nice to for even the younger people in the office to know what was in the beginning the kind of work which was happening so there are the archives are also available now we're still working on it so this is how we keep kept ourselves engaged um the the whole book is book and the archive is the effort of everybody in biome. The drawings are done by people from biome and uh, the book design. So it was really nice that we could get out from the work of architecture or water and we could engage in something so very different and it kept our spirits up. So this is my last slide. I'm passing the baton to Sharat. Sharat is one of our senior most architects at Biome. He's been with us for past 18 years. He did his undergraduate in Manipal and his master's in Shur, Switzerland. He's also involved in teaching and research. On to you, Sharat. Thank you. Thank you, Ayaz. Thank you, Chitra. Sharad, you'll have to unmute yours. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Yeah, all right. So, um, thank you. Uh, and uh, what I'll be doing now is I'll be taking you through uh, five projects of ours, uh, starting with uh, the, some of the small projects that we do. So, this uh, first project uh, that you're seeing, it's a uh, home for a very young couple. They had uh, inherited this plot from their uh, grandparents. Uh, it's a small plot, 30 by 40. Uh, so, you know, 
in 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 Bangalore, these are the smaller plots that are available. So uh, this is the plot that we got. So the family had bought this thirty years back, and this is one of the last plots to be built. So in the first picture, you see the how the neighbors have built very close to the edge, but in front of the tree. So this uh, uh, in the, what you see in the second picture, in front of the plot is this uh, huge uh, tree, uh, African tulip tree. So uh, what you see in the first picture is given the neighboring homes and this large tree and the tree which all of us love, that the site. Is almost always in shade, which means uh, it would be a challenge. Uh, life would be a challenge once uh, you know you start uh, you build this home. Given that we didn't want to, uh, you know, harm this tree, our response was that we take the home vertical. We kept it very low at the front and uh, vertical at the back. That allowed us that we could we had to lop off one branch, but then the rest of the tree was unharmed. But the house also responds that you enjoy the tree from each level, so that's the finished uh, home that you see. And like most of our homes, it's an uh, earthen home built with soil. In this case, it doesn't have a basement, but the soil was procured from a nearby project which uh, had a basement and they had excess soil, right? So one particular demand here the client had is he had a particular dislike for toilet tiles, so he wanted. Um, Walls in the bathroom which are without tiles. We managed to sort of, you know, do a halfway thing that you'd have some walls with tile when there's plumbing. But then our reference and our solution uh, was what happens in the nearby villages. So a lot of construction happens through stone slab, what is locally called as chapris. And the Kanade brothers they have used this technique a lot in their work. So we propose that some of the inner walls be built of this. The ones. Uh, you know the bathroom walls uh, be built with this, so it's it's an easily maintainable one. But that meant that we had to then design the cross section of the home for the available size, uh, a size which could be easily handled without machines. So that's why you see that the house goes up and down at different levels, and that that decision was governed by the size of the stone that was there. Right, and here you see is the ground floor. So what we have done as a response is uh, one we took it taller, but we also introduced a large skylight in between, which is right up there. So the house receives its light directly from up above, um, and not not really from from the sides. So this also gives that when you're within the house, it's the experience of being below a tree. On the upper floor here, we have created a small courtyard because the neighbors are so close; you don't have privacy, so they. This was a family which wanted, you know, to spend time outside outside the rooms. So we created this courtyard of sorts on the upper floor. So uh, what we have on the ground floor are the living quarters and one bedroom, and the upper floor is the main bedroom. So this is uh, the upper floor you see with the stone walls. You climb a few levels, you have the bathrooms, and then you go out onto that courtyard space. And this is a large seat for them to uh, read and watch the tree. So that's the courtyard, and the small gate here where their friends can come up without disturbing the family below. Right, and we reach the topmost floor, which is a small unit, which was a home office, but such that it can also be rented out. So all of these are, you know, overlooking the tree, and uh, the home is a response to this tree, which is outside the property. So that's the home. So the next project I'm taking you through is again a small plot like this, a 30 by 40, but a much, uh, much more built. In the sense, this is a regular family uh, with three age groups: grandparents, parents, and children, and a lot of requirements. Um, so this also, they they too had these two little trees uh, that you see on the front of the side, uh, right? And again, here our response was to save these trees. So instead of a 30 by 40, we ended up with by leaving 10 feet for the trees, and we are now building a you know, 30 by 30 plot, and with a much more dense requirement. The plot had a slope which we used to our advantage again to accommodate different functions. Right. So that's the finished project. But uh, for for me, more, more than this is uh, you know the first family was a younger family and open to a lot of ideas in the sense of you know build lesser. 
but here is a family which is spanning three generations and needing a lot of uh, build spaces for different requirements right and the fun was about accommodating all of that so and you know they had these little uh, things that they wanted from you know the homes that they have in their hometowns so some nostalgic elements like that so again this home also in a cross section there is this art which allows one to experience it from all over but otherwise these are you know tiny spaces for living you know study and you know it's quite a packed situation in this home a lot of requirements in terms of appliances different utilities but i think the most important part of this home is the roof and this is something that we address a lot in our work is that the roof is the one which receives a lot of your natural resources sun light water so what you see here is that you know we end up designing these spaces as well so what you see here is the water is harvested uh, you have solar which is providing electricity for the home hot water wastewater recycling at the back uh, a biogas uh, unit so this family is also very careful in the sense of how they live uh, live very ecologically with the uh, consuming less the next home is on a larger plot uh, they used to be a home there it's a 100 by 70 plot so this family wished to take down the old home and build a new one but uh, the approach we followed is when you're taking down the old home you generate a lot of debris and this should not go out and pollute so both us and the client work that a lot of it can be reused back in the home i think uh, only 30% of the debris left aside but everything else and that that too was because of lack of space everything else was reused in this home so the stone wall you see in this first picture used to be the foundations of the old home that's the old home that you see here we had some wooden rafters a lot of wood right and that's the new proposal <clears throat> the new proposal was a home for two of his daughters the legacy that uh, mr raghav wanted to leave behind so the taking down of this home was a dismantling not a demolition just like we do for uh, household waste you separate into wet dry uh, medical waste you know and so on so even here when you dismantle you are able to segregate it into different uh, you know components so here you see concrete there is stone elsewhere there is brick out here so there is wood there is steel so once we do that we were able to then reuse it with lesser effort um this particular soil is site had a weak uh, soil so our engineers proposed what's called as a well foundation it's a type of a pile so a lot of the old concrete was broken down into aggregate and so that that's what the red circles you see these are the different positions of the wells so the uh, concrete was broken down uh, into uh, aggregate new concrete was made out of it and used to fill these wells and then a great beam and the house sits above this so that's the casting of the great beam and you see that every material now takes it different from the foundation is now the old wall the plain stones are the staircases we used the bricks wherever we needed plaster for the rest we uh, made new mud bricks and that's the finished house that you're seeing so uh, using of waste is something also that we've been looking at quite a lot and working so uh, raghavan's home is one where we did it to the most these are some pictures of the home and that's the upper floor so i'll skip through this project because chitra has spoken of this uh, one uh, but this one is where the idea of reuse was a part of the early thought you know because we knew that this building will be taken down at some point so what i have here are more pictures of the insides now uh, this is a new type of uh, project that we are working on these are farming collectives uh, that uh, we are working at uh, what you see here on the screen are two different projects one in pur in karnataka and the other one on the outskirts of bangalore the left side is a pur property which is a uh, old uh, coffee estate on the right side it's a village called tagati 
just across the border in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so what's happening here is uh, a lot of city people who want to look at farming as a lifestyle choice are getting together um, and um, investing collectively in a farm. It's more a lifestyle choice than a financial investment, wanting to grow and live off the land. So our role here has also been to, uh, one is to plan the land, but here we are working with uh, domain experts, permaculturists, people who understand conservation both in, uh, in, in the perspective of land and also in wildlife, which is more important in the first case in food. So our approach here has been to understand the land. The primary use is farming. So we understand the land in different, uh, in its context. So what you see here are the hydrology studies. We understand the water flows on the land, set up riparian buffers. So these would be zones of no activity, uh, which should, or limited activity as the case may be. So no activity would mean uh, no building here, uh, no farming, limited would be, you can take produce of these lands. But what setting up these zones does is that um, it uh, retains the health of these, uh, these uh, waterways and prevents soil erosion, basically contributes to the health of the land. So once this is done, uh, we also put in different buffers. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Tagati project, we have uh, wildlife buffers. Both of these are adjoining the forest land. So we have wildlife buffers uh, and other zones of conservation. Right? So once these are established, once zones of uh, farming are established, then we look at the least uh, productive land as one, once where you build. And uh, so the identification of where you build happens through a process of elimination. And then beyond that, we do look at you know forming of water bodies. The soil gives, uh, the soil that you get from making these water bodies is used for construction. Right? So these are projects which are now under design and uh, the construction should soon start. So these are the visuals of the project. And with this, I'll hand over uh, the talk to Anurag. Um, so Anurag has been with us for, I think, 12 or 13 years now. Uh, he studied in Kolhapur and then has a master's from SET. So Anurag, to you. Thank you, Sarat. Hi, uh, good morning. So I'll be talking about a uh, couple of projects what we're working on. And uh, these projects involve, apart from the architectural intervention, uh, it requires the roles of being a farmer and uh, understanding the land from a farmer's perspective. So the first project what we're looking at is a, a Masalewale village. This uh, project is located uh, near Pune in the Western Ghats on, so on the eastern side of it and uh, it's spread across 40 acres of her land and the clients here wanted to, so the clients are uh, Sohana Masalewale, so these people are into agriculture from a long time. So this land they wanted to dedicate it to uh, demonstrating the land or the farming's way in a permaculture way as well as the animal husbandry what they're proposing here to be done in a more sustainable manner so the whole uh, conversations and the discussions what we had in the beginning they uh, revolved around how we can be shepherds of the lands and uh, not really the owners of it so the focus is not on extracting the resource but it's about conserving the resource and how we can prolong and increase our resilience uh, while living in this land. So to ensure that uh, we conserve these resources and uh, retain the biodiversity over here. So that was the whole focus of the work and the built environments here were very limited and uh, only for most of mostly for the animals is what it was focused on. So we started the study in the same manner what Sharad just uh, described that uh, we did the water flow analysis, we understood the watershed in, that, uh, in this area. So what we identified that there were three uh, micro watersheds in this land of 40 acres, 
and uh, they were divided by these valleys and uh, ridges coming in so we calculated uh, these uh, watersheds and uh, based on that we started working on developing the strategies to conserve the soil to conserve the water and to conserve the moisture in the soil cuz permaculture looks more at the moisture which is there in the soil than adding an external water for uh, growing plants so conserving the moisture in this land became a crucial uh, part for designing these uh, strategies so we studied uh, different researches which were done or undertaken by tamil nadu agricultural university the deshpande foundation and uh, pani foundation so these people have done an extensive research on how to work in dry land agriculture so we took those inputs studied them and based on the slope analysis of the land we narrowed down on the practices which made sense in our particular space so we uh, introduced in the higher slopes contour trenches and uh, stone contour walls to slow down the water movement and it also restricts the soil erosion so before you start getting your growth of the grass and the plants and the trees over there you start uh, getting these uh, artificial barriers to slow down the water at the higher slopes and in the sloping lands where we couldn't build the trenches we introduced the half moon terraces so these half moon terraces are nothing but cutting half part of the circle and piling it on the other side to slow the water you put in there a native species of fruit bearing trees so that you attract the flora and fauna over there so that way you have the birds coming in bees coming in so you create an ecosystem which is local to that region we in the water streams which were there in the uh, natural condition we introduced in that grass waterways so these are uh, nothing but grasses planted along the water uh, uh, the water streams so these hold the water uh, sorry the hold the soil in place as well as the rocks or the smaller stones which are there so that way the soil erosion is restricted the water flow slows down and uh, you don't have erosion in the further downstream as well at the central locations where the water flow is becoming higher so uh, in these regions our, even though our site is only up to this point the land slopes further up so there is a lot of water coming in even at the beginning of our site so we introduced these smaller detention ponds in these locations uh, to hold the water and release it slowly when it's raining heavily so that the water gets recharged into the ground than flowing out of our site so the whole study revolved around how you can slow down the water flow at the uh, lowest portion of these uh, slopes we introduced the uh, harvesting ponds so these are large water structures which hold the water enough to suffice for half years water requirement so that's sort of taking the second crop in the land uh, with using the same water you have saved so we uh, put in or we design these almost half an acre half an hectare land uh, for storing the water on the upstream of the farm so what it does is the water stays there you can keep it there so it goes into the ground and as it is going into the ground it increases the soil moisture in the lowing uh, the leeward area as well so as the monsoon gets over you start using these harvesting structures the harvesting ponds and as it goes below you start using it for farming again because the moisture content is still there so across the land we placed uh, recharge wells so we are looking at about 100 uh, plus recharge wells to be placed in these regions so this we are currently at a stage where we are finding out looking at the strata of this area where to locate how to locate and that is how we arrived these arrived at this master plan which includes very little of buildings so whatever the buildings are there are for animals and the caretakers uh, stay area so that is the extent of built spaces what we are looking at so when we were looking at uh, designing this cow sheds for the space we also were thinking where to get the fodder from so the rooftop of the cow shed also became the place where you can grow the fodder and the fodder gets its nutrients from the cow sheds as the occupants of it will give the manure to grow the fodder so the system sort of closes its loop in the building itself the 
smaller structures which we are looking for the caretakers or a place for people to relax we are uh, trying and uh, you, we are trying to use this uh, local way of building with a waterland dog where they use a karvi grass which is grown in the uh, higher lands so those are the mar regions of the plateaus in the mountain so you take the karvi grass from there and uh, use the soil which is available at the site and create a structure which uh, creates the similar kind of a light and air quality in the, these spaces as what you have in the uh, local villages so that is how we did this structure so the next project i'm going to talk about is a project what we are working on with um, madhya pradesh tourism board and uh, we are working with them to do uh, to develop a rural homestay and uh, coincidentally even hurna shala is uh, doing uh, is involved in a similar project uh, in other part of madhya pradesh so we are working on bundelkhand and bagelkhand of madhya pradesh to introduce these homestays so the study also included uh, understanding and uh, studying the kind of typology of the buildings what you have in these regions to study the materials and how they use it and as you uh, travel across these lands you can observe that even within 30 kilometers of a distance the material changes the uh, the way or the typology of houses changes and it uh, gives you a very nice understanding about how people live uh, how people live over there so the lifestyle in this design becomes a crucial part as uh, the people who are going to come and stay in these houses they are going to come there to experience the culture of this land and for them to understand and experience the land's culture they have to be part of it so the inserts were done in these uh, existing structures so they had these kind of a courtyard spaces so this is in bagelkhand what we are looking at and uh, in that region you have these smaller courtyards with uh, the buildings and the rooms happening around so we introduced and identified these spaces where you can make it like an insert rather than uh, placing something in middle of nowhere so people can see when there is a harvest happening on when there is a grass cutting is going on they can see when the cows are being fed or when they getting uh, when they are milking the cows so it becomes a part of their whole experience the challenge what we looked at in this space was also uh, the thing in the sense that uh, the older structures which are there you need to adapt to the way they have built or the typology of the houses in those regions because earlier houses were built for to be used only in the night times most of the times people were in there in the house and uh, whenever they would be there they would be sleeping in the courtyards but when the guest comes they expect a certain kind of uh, comfort there so that was a, a trade off we had to work with that how you uh, get the kind of views what you want and keep it exciting for them but at the same time from the exterior point of view it remains merged in the structure so every project uh, gives you a new kind of a learning so in this project we learned that the complicated project uh, the detailed drawings what we make can be a kind of or they can create a new kind of a challenge instead of resolving the way of uh, in communicating your design to the people because the people who are working here are either locals who are uh, uh mostly illiterate or they've studied only till 10th standard so they can't read the drawings so what happens over here is to uh, understand that how to communicate so sometimes these drawings got thrown out of the window and uh, we had to actually sketch it there in front of them and show it to them and uh, one guy actually took out the paper from me and he himself drew what I was trying to explain to him so the complicated drawings are not always the solution for things as what we learned the last project i'm going to end with is a quick uh, competition study or uh, kind of work we did recently for chatisgarh uh, public toilets so the project was very interesting as the government had uh, come up with an idea of doing kind of an inclusive public toilet which had a space for all the genders as well as a physically challenged people and a smaller space for uh, uh commercial use so they wanted to look at three models so we worked on a couple of them and uh, looked at using the container structure so that we reduce on our foundation cost look at uh, making it faster so that it can be deployed everywhere easily the container also en enabled us that the movement the portability of the structure is very easy 
so that uh, the structure can be moved around and place in any places uh, which are very narrow or very crucial to get to. So that was the quick study we worked on. So with this, I'm going to end my presentation and I'll hand it over to Shubha to take it forward from here. So Shubha is uh, leading our water team at the Biome Environmental Trust and uh, she's been part of the trust from the beginning of the inception of the project. She works on uh, water management, groundwater studies, as well as wastewater management and wetlands in Bangalore. So Shubha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anurag. Yeah, thanks, Anura. I'll just share my screen. Yeah, hi. Uh, assuming my screen's uh, visible. So I'm going to be telling, uh, as bi at the Biome Trust, the water team works with communities largely in and around Bangalore. Uh, to see how communities can manage their water better, to see what is it that we can learn from these communities, and then make sure that these are it's possible to be implemented at a city level. So this is the story of one community. Uh, it's based on the story, uh, which is on 36 acres of land towards the outskirts of the city on a place that's called Sarjapur Road, where there is no access to piped water supply. There is no water supply from the municipality. So it's the story of how this community got together and along with support from Biome, came up with a system such that now they're able to manage all their water requirements in-house and they're very close to zero liquid discharge. The treated wastewater is reused. So we'll just speak about the practices that they have implemented over a period of time. It has taken about 12 years for them to get to where they are right now, but the story is worth telling. And over a period of time, we have developed this comic book to tell the same story. So uh, we've been trying to do comic books around various themes. The characters are often called Meera and Jalaj for Water and Lotus. So here they are uh, in the current year or a little earlier, 2017, where they're looking at a garden and they're speaking about how this garden came about. And Neera tells the story. This community was kind of the plots were cut out by the developers, sold in the year 2000 uh, when the place was hardly populated. He was, of course, speaking of parks and roads and a clubhouse and swimming pool. There wasn't a whole lot of talk of water at that time because water was not hard to come by. And that's the story that Meera tells Jalaj. And as happens with any gated community or a land development that happens, initially the developer dug some bore wells. Then people started buying the plots. They started digging their own bore wells. Water was plentiful. It was used very freely for construction, for car wash, for what have you. And as happens everywhere over a period of time, by 2005, what had happened was that the bore wells were starting to go dry. And because there's no municipal water supply in this area, the only source of water that they had to then look for when the bore wells within their campus were running dry was to call tankers from outside. And like in any other group, the other thought at that time was, can we just not dig another bore well? Should we buy another tanker? And how long will this last? These were the questions that were occurring to them. It was around this time that Biome really slept, uh, came into the life of this community. At the same time, while in the summer, the bore wells were dry and there wasn't enough water. When it rained, what they saw that the layout flooded up very quickly. So the layout kind of slopes towards the main road. There is almost a 30 foot drop from the rear end of the gated community to the fore end where it joins the road. The stormwater drains weren't completely built at this time. And they could see that there was a whole lot of flooding. And then the questions naturally came up to say that if you are flooding at one time and dry the other time, isn't there some kind of balance? Isn't there something that we can do about? it. So that's when uh, Biome kind of took its work further. We spoke to them about how if you just by digging another bore well, we are not increasing the total volume of water that's available to the community, but it's really groundwater recharge that has to be undertaken at scale. And it's not only about groundwater recharge, but a whole set of best practices that have to be implemented for community living. And we'll speak about that. And of course, at that at that time, the first thing that they did was to come together and form an association, which was called the Plot Owners Association. And there was an acceptance that just by digging bore wells, 
and which was not very easy because every house wanted to be independent wanted to have its own water security and they thought that it came from digging a bore well on their plot so it took a lot of convincing where the association could step forward and disallow digging of private bore wells and the whole approach that was taken was that common bore wells would supply water to the entire community but everybody had to dig recharge wells to put water into the ground so what we see here in the chapter 6 at the bottom is the first few recharge wells that were dug at a community level uh, with the help of the local well digging community and i'll speak about them as well because in a way this what started here and perhaps a little earlier as well has moved on to what we call a million well campaign for bangalore so this community in a way which is called rainbow drive had dug the initial few wells um uh, as once the wells were dug when the rains came the water actually went into the wells and started to recharge the ground the first thing that they noticed was that the flooding reduced so the important thing and when the layout floods there's significant flooding there's about 6 7 feet of standing water the vehicles can't go in or out of the community so while there wasn't any perceived improvement to the ground water with the digging of the recharge wells just the going away of the flooding was was a big relief to them and over a period of time starting 2009 they started implementing a whole lot of conservation measures in earnest so the first one was that every house digs its own recharge well this is a community on 36 acres with about uh, 300 odd homes that have already been built over a period of time they have dug more than 300 recharge wells each recharge well is about 3 feet in diameter 25 feet deep can put into the ground about 5000 liters every time it fills up they also started to take up various awareness drives across the community for water conservation to encourage people to use lesser water the first step there was metering every house was metered uh, they had to pay for the water that they used initially much like the government the tariff that they had for water was not very high it was at 6 rupees per 1000 liters but soon enough they came up with an increasing block tariff which severely restricted excessive use of water right now what we see in this pricing policy that's actually moved up to about 120 rupees per 1000 liters when you are consuming over 40000 liters of water over a period of month uh what really happened as a result of this was that the the people in the community started speaking to each other they were comparing water bills and they really wanted and at times there were homes that were paying 2 to 3000 rupees for their water and that really started to drive down consumption or uh, before the water bills were introduced the average consumption per person per day uh in the community was going up to 200 80 liters per person per day and now along with this metering as well as a certain bunch of other practices i'll speak about they are at about 110 liters per person per day currently of fresh water consumption so that's more than a 50% reduction in their water consumption itself along with that the houses also started to see the merit in storing and reusing their rain water itself so a lot of the houses because they were paying for the water that they consumed they thought it a lot better to store the rooftop water to filter it store it and reuse it and in this way they could bring down their water tariff uh, their water bills considerably so this was we should remember a community which was earlier a little opposed to storing and reusing rain water because they they were not sure of the water quality but with the tariff and with the observation of the rain water itself they actually started to and most houses here now store and reuse their rain, rain water and for 2 to 3 months of the year they are able to manage with uh, rain water alone we also saw that over a period of time the bore well started to yield water again uh, and the the effect of all of this recharge kind of swung into action and the bore well started to be sources of water again and around 2014 they also started to think along with biome about what was happening to their wastewater uh, that was generated within the community they were generating over 200 in about 200 to 400000 liters of wastewater on a daily basis it wasn't getting treated uh, it was just discharged into the storm water drain 
uh, with a lot of consulting, looking around for various vendors and technologies, they finally went ahead and implemented a biological wastewater treatment technology. Uh, it wasn't easy to convince the whole community to generate the funds that were required for it and actually set up this wastewater treatment plant. But what really happened was where earlier they were spending over a lakh rupees per month to run a wastewater treatment plant, which was giving them water of doubtful quality. Now, in the form of a garden, they were able to treat their wastewater with no pumping a very little mechanical devices, mostly managed through the planted gravel filter and the anaerobic filter. And they were able to bring down the cost for running and maintaining a plant of about 200,000 liters per day of wastewater to around 30,000 rupees per month, which is really the money they paid for a gardener and some water quality testing over the period of a month. Uh, and once this was done, the treated wastewater was plumbed back to all the houses. They started using it for gardening. They also compost their waste and have a lot of best practices in place for solid waste management. As a result of which the community now has gardens, every empty plot has uh, fruit trees, uh, there's banana, papita, wastewater and compost is extensively used. So much so that they had excess treat treated wastewater, which they were able to then sell to a farmer close by and uh, there are also people who are interested in taking this treated wastewater onto fill a lake in the neighborhood so that's where the story is as of now so that's the story and it has led on to uh, the in a way this has become a place a kind of go-to mecca for a lot of people wanting to learn more about water conservation water harvesting also about bringing communities together to manage their water and it has also led on to us running a million wells campaign where we see the entire city of Bangalore as a spawn city, much like what happened at Rainbow Drive, where on 36 acres with 300 wells, the water table, which was not available at 1000 feet, now they have bore wells at 360 feet below ground level, which yield over 1 lakh liters of water every day. So the idea is to see whether a lot that along with the traditional Bovi well digging community, how can we take the learnings from this community and several other such in Bangalore across the entire city? So yeah, thank you very much. I'm done. Um, I'll just introduce Mr. Vishwanath now, uh, who will kind of sum up everything that we've spoken about so far. Uh, he's a civil engineer and urban planner by qualification founder trustee of the Biome Environmental Trust, adjunct faculty at the Azim Premji University. Uh, he's also a member of various technical com uh, committees which advise the government on rainwater harvesting, on wastewater treatment and reuse on groundwater. Uh, he's very popularly known as Zen Rain Man on social media and a lot of the videos that he's put up are extensively watched. And uh, his article in the Hindu, which would come under the uh, what a wise column was very look for looked forward to and uh, he will continue from here i'll just stop sharing thank you shubha thank you shubha thanks thanks uh, thanks shubha and thanks uh, to the team uh, it's not much that i want to say but to relatively talk about the journey that we have gone through uh, Stephen Covey, the management guru, sort of describes uh, two areas which we can divide the world into, a zone of concern and a zone of influence. So the zone of concern could be global, it could be climate change, it could be um, issues of, of war in I Iraq or, or, and so on and so forth. But the zone of influence is where you can personally or professionally do something about it, right? Do something about the zone of concern. In Biome, our concerns were majorly two. One is the social concern of inequality and poverty, and lack of employment. The second was the environmental and ecological concern, which is represented by global warming, climate change, the destruction of the natural resource base that we have, and pollution stream. So right from the beginning, the, the journey has been, even in a small plot of land, how do we make sure that we do minimal damage to the environment, if possible, be productive about the environment and ecology. And in the process of doing that, how do we enhance the livelihoods of the people, the construction workers, the masons, the carpenters, the well diggers, the farmers, anybody and everybody who's part of this journey, so that they become more empowered and have more agency on the work they do. So this has been Biome's journey right from the beginning. 
both as an architectural practice and as as a trust which now works at larger issues and as shubha explained as anurag and sharad explained each one of our houses demonstrate rainwater harvesting wastewater reuse grey water recycling you know uh, all that as as much as possible and then we take it further to the community level as in rainbow drive we take it to the city as with the million wells program where we are trying to provide hopefully good employment to about 750 well diggers from a traditional well digging community we work at intermediate scales like watersheds where we help communities rejuvenate lakes use treated wastewater as a resource and so on and so forth we work with government schools to make sure that they become water secure through rooftop rainwater harvesting and we work with villages to make sure that villages take care of wastewater which is generated in the villages and that they also have access to rainwater harvesting that their tanks and traditional water systems are are uh, kept in a better shape and that the community community takes ownership with the trust it's always been one of a, a small partner trying to influence and work with the community to make bigger change we never try to take credit for the work that we do we always hope to be the triggers which help sort out a problem because of the knowledge base that we have that's been biom's journey and in all of this we've also focused a lot on communication like the comic book that you saw which shubha displayed we have on our website called bengaluru.urbanwaters.in which we'll put up on the chat open source knowledge on whatever we've learned in the times that we have spent understanding water waste water sanitation and ground water that's all i had to share as a summing up and uh, i'm looking forward to listen to sandeep and his comments on what he has heard uh, we being uh, together for quite a long time and we learn from each other as much as possible thank you thank you anurag amazingly charming presentation and absolutely broad is uh, not just charming but the diversity of your work the detailing of your work is extremely impressive i know about uh, chit Or that is the first thing that I'm getting to do together like this, and it's so uh, hard. And uh, what you said, Vishwanath, is absolutely right. There is the uh, domain of concern, and then there is the domain of like an ant just going at it and creating solutions wherever you think there is a problem. And then you come up with such a huge, enormous. Body of work, which uh, starts creating tremendous impact, and, uh, and it's uh, it's such a, a satisfying uh, journey, I believe. And uh, but to begin with, I want to start by uh, saying that we have developed quite a big team and a lovely team. What has been the problem? Because you know you have a lot of Who will be individual? Who will uh, be Sandeep able to do uh, this? Sorry to interrupt you, Sandeep. There is some disturbance from your side. We are not able to hear you properly. I don't know. What can I do to? Should I remove? Uh, should I stop the video and just uh, speak? No, I think now it's better than earlier. Better, Sandeep. When you're closer to the mic, you're a lot clearer. Yeah. Okay, so I'll come close. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to start by talking to you both, Chitra and Vishwanath, the whole process of building teams, because as I said, that uh, uh, there are individuals who do great work, but you have been able to do not just individually great work, but also as a team, and you've built a fantastic team. So I also saw that there is a a lot more women in your team than men uh, has that had any influence on the way you all work uh, what is the diversity of your team i know most of you here have been architects but uh, except vishwanath uh, how do you work on so many different uh, areas of work or specialization uh, uh, as a team if you can just throw a little bit of light on on this entire aspect of your practice The, the the teams began with architecture part and yeah so we i think almost uh, 
more women than men in the architecture part too because right now um, there are a lot more girls who join architecture studies and so internship and work too so it's nice that the team is multidisciplinary because of the people who are working in water and they've come with the interest of working in water that is why i think it will be better that uh, vishnu tells you about the various kinds of people who are in the team water hmm. Yeah, I think Shubha should talk about it because Shubha is ex Infosys, right? And my team in the, uh, my team or our team in Bio, we don't even have an office. We work from individual homes, and uh, the starting people actually came from Infosys. So you, we can thank the software burnout for for providing <laughs> us, you know, labor to work in the uh, in the water sector. I think, and so and it, it's been uh, very true that uh, uh, as a trust we. placed special emphasis on listening and conversations with the community and learning with the community we have done most of our learning especially from women in rural areas or artisans like farmers and well diggers from in the urban areas and the team as such and shubha will tell you about it the trust is essentially women <laughs> it's that is also driven by women even me i am a naam ke vaaste figure like you sandeep i want to take up painting and book writing also if you can give me some tips i'd be very happy to learn from you and go on there yes <laughs> shubha would you like to add something to that since we are speaking about the diversity i'll tell you a little bit about how we work and how diverse the people are so we do have a doctor in the team we have somebody with a background in pharmacy so the doctor is able to uh, of course she does a whole bunch of other things as well but she's also genuinely interested in conservation and bird life biodiversity somebody who studied pharmacy so she takes water quality very seriously so every time we are doing our test she looks at that bit of information uh, people who studied uh, the social studies so uh, at the azim premji university so uh, planning so we we uh, and it's also been the nature of the team in the sense we have our own structure so to say for recruitment a lot of people initially just say they want to volunteer with us or in certain cases they just want to know a little bit more about what we do so we started off very early given that we didn't we could not afford an office space and given bangalore distances were far away and even before whatsapp got very popular somehow we were all working remotely trying to and because people who were on the team were genuinely interested in what they do and would stick back we we didn't necessarily have to meet so that was the earlier years now of course whatsapp even before the pandemic started a lot of like vishwanath would tell you we have multiple groups running at every time for each of the projects that we do and uh, so so yeah that's how it has been and people we have our own hierarchy in terms of how you become more actively involved in the projects that you do so initially you're just a volunteer on the sidelines interested part is coming along on site visits when possible talking to your friends about it then you actually sign up on any one particular project where you start to help the core project team and slowly as you learn more about the way that the trust works sometimes you start to head a project or then be more involved in the overall vision for the biome trust as well so that's how it has been and uh, people have just been interested and very self driven and motivated and unlike what vishwanath says it's uh, he's the inspiring figure so people do look up to him a lot of the advice and mentoring that comes from there i think that also holds the team together in various ways so it's a free and open team most information is available and known to everybody so all of that helps as a culture yeah chitra you wanted to say something sandeep i must tell about uh, the people who don't really speak very much in in the architecture part of it are the engineers or we should say the contractors and so we began our journey together with three other uh, engineers who had also just recently qualified as civil engineers and me as an architect and we worked together and built this so our team is not only the architects but it's a, it's a much larger consortium with the masons and uh, all the others who come in the building trades and we've been together for 30 years the first three contractors and us so we've grown together learning together we have developed details but they're not very good in uh, speaking we can't get them <laughs> to tell them that do a presentation but they've been an extremely integral part of it and then we have engineers who work with us who work 
uh, quantity surveying and other issues because we also like uh, to say that this kind of architecture is not a boutique practice, it's a mainstream practice. So we've done about 700 homes in Bangalore, so that's not possible if, if you just do something um, very unique and we're doing it for middle class. So it was very important that people learn the nuances of the structure of this kind of working, this kind of design within the office. So they work as engineers in the office and then they become contractors. No, that's, in fact, I was going to ask you exactly about this, about the artisans, because can you tell us a little bit about how you started working on earth? Because everybody has a different story on that. And uh, you are so proficient at it now. Uh, how did your journey of working with earth really start? Proficient at uh, working with earth or telling the story? <laughs> no, so, well, it started with uh, making our own house, the basement I'm sitting in. So we were learning about building with earth. So we're going to Oroville or to the construction which had happened in Bangalore. So Vishnath used to show me these. I came to Bangalore only in 1991 after marriage. So I had no idea of earth construction from uh, during the studies. Okay. Came here and Vishnath would show me what's happening at India Institute of Science or we also went to Oroville and saw what was happening. And uh, well, it was very difficult to convince the people <coughs> of Earth because we had no, never done it. So when we came and saw our plot and saw this lovely Earth, we got very excited and decided we'll have a basement. And we'd never made a basement, so but we made this basement and we built with it. <laughs> Yeah, and that time is when we made the different kinds of mortar with earth and built it and we tried, we tried a lot of stuff in this house. So this house for me and for the whole team is a laboratory for ideas, it's not this architect's house, a shrine, but it's a place where you keep trying different things. Mm -hmm. so that's how it started. And it was so easy in Bangalore, but when you walk the talk and we must give credit to the city and the people here, that they accepted it. And so while we were designing our own house, we, were, we got the projects for two, three houses nearby. And so this was a time, a political time where people had started building their own homes, so we're moving into capitalism, so they're, move, they're getting to buy land, and so they were making homes, and these are small homes. And I, it was possible to do their job because I could tell them that we will not only design, we can also build because we have a team. And we have the same team had worked for six years. No, that's nice because uh, if I can also go a little deeper into uh, either Sharat or Chitra, both of you could uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, you know, one thing about Mali Baker, and I don't think there are many people who's been able, who's been able to do this. Can you hear me? Sharat, you'll yeah. have something about your phone. It has to be no, no, I can hear, I can hear. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now in the last, say, 15 years, 20 years or so, there have been a lot of, uh, 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 there's been a large growth of uh, sustainable architecture in the country. But yet, very few practices are able to do what Laurie was able to do, which is make really economical buildings. Uh, what has your experience been? I was particularly impressed with the initial houses that you all did, which were catering to not just uh, the affluent uh, of Bangalore, but also to the middle classes uh, in Bangalore. So uh, as compared to normal construction in Bangalore, how do your buildings fare in terms of money? Sharath, would you like to speak about it? Yeah, I mean, we still uh, work in a lot of middle class homes. I mean, the two homes that I showed, they are middle class families. The first home, they were a couple in their 20s, you know, just started working. Uh, they had a much lower budget, but yes, we managed to pull it off. I mean, uh, that house was again uh, looking at what you don't need, you know, in terms of by, just by changing the material, we're not able to save costs. But we work a lot with them. We dialogue with them to understand what what you really need and what you can do without. And that's been our approach uh, towards uh, managing costs, per se. The second home that I showed, um, they had a lot more in terms of requirements. They were not able to reduce requirements. 
but the process of dialogue helped them understand that if they need that they'll have to change their budgets and they went about doing it 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 worked well with these two families it does not work with everyone some people leave after after a bit of engagement no so again the costs are lower compared to a conventional cost and if you do it apple to apple comparison when you see the kind of uh, uh, design inputs which come in we can never beat a mastery a labor contractor's work but then and with a labor contractor you don't ask the details you ask with an architect so if the architect to architect comparison is done we do still much lower and in terms of uh, it's not seen as a cost at the at the beginning but cost as one uses a building one when one lives and there's a lot of those costs which the clients do say it's much lower the living cost of let's say so when you put in the systems of water and waste water it makes a big difference in terms of cost in terms of economics but also the cost physical you know, the whole idea of uh, having to call up a tanker for water or cleaning a waste water growing food all that is there is joy in these houses a lot yeah Uh, Sharad, if you can, uh, because I uh, you spoke uh, very beautifully about these three elements in your uh, building. You know, one is the courtyard, the other is yeah. uh, your roof, uh, right. and your engagement with the clients. Uh, yeah. If you can elaborate a little more on these three aspects, how has the courtyard changed? For uh, is it an integral part of your design work? Uh, how has it changed in an urban setting? How is it used? Yeah, uh, uh, your roof is so important uh, as uh, service utilities. Yeah. Uh, if you can elaborate a little more on this. So uh, the roof itself, I mean, uh, Chitra and Vishwanath's house. That's that's the first one where the roof has been so elaborately looked at for food, water, energy, and waste. You know, and uh, having a standing example like that. Uh, people understand you know when they able to see it so many of our first engagements with clients end up that we take them to their home show them through uh, uh, you know walk them through the roof and uh, show them what, what, how, how how does their life improve some people will want to talk to other clients because the questions come about maintenance and you know such other things so we put them in touch with some old clients so we are able to uh, pull this off quite easily in bangalore and uh, most of these people who have a roof like this tell us that the quality of their life uh, like chitra was saying you don't have to worry about where your water is coming from um, you know you have power almost on the clock so that's that that's uh, fairly understood by our clients and um, regarding the courtyard itself well i mean there it was uh, the site which uh, push for such a space right the, the clients themselves did not ask for a courtyard but then we did need us we did want a space where uh, you know you can get out of your room stay in the open and still have some privacy so um, do you think a courtyard is still relevant in the in, in an urban uh, house today uh, in tight spaces like that yes i would think so uh, more for privacy uh, a courtyard in a climatic sense doesn't work very well in bangalore because we have chilly evenings and mosquitoes you know so both of them but uh, but, but as open space uh, i think it's it's a good thing to have so yeah uh, anurag uh, i think uh, what has been also beautifully shown in your presentations is how you have moved from the urban to the peri urban and to into the rural in in, in a way that's the opposite of say honar shala we moved from the rural into the urban and uh, that's a, a very interesting journey what has been your experience in the rural in terms of working with clients or uh, being an architect in an in an in, a, in an environment which doesn't use architects yeah that's uh, been the largest challenge over there to get them to understand what is the value addition you can bring in to make them understand that okay you have some value over there because they used to dealing with uh, a mastery or a mason in many of the cases the owner himself would build the house so they don't have this idea of someone coming in and telling them that but uh, it 
is happening through engagement so we are in the process of uh, doing these executions right now so we're trying to make them understand what is the value of those areas and the kind of ataris or the uh, smaller roofs the double roofs what they have over there so to get them to understand the importance of it because now slowly they are also trying to move away from those and they're building with these uh, the uh, pradhan mantri with uh, gram vikas yojana with that they, they are doing these houses which are with rcc that's uh, through a constraint of the money or the available techniques which are there for people or known to people or the understanding of this pakka house and uh, considering their houses as kacha house that something is very difficult to make them understand that uh, what they are doing is really good so in one of the places we had uh, proposed the khapra is what they call it over there and uh, for the roof and it took us a lot of effort to make them understand that what it is doing is much better than a say manglo tile or a rcc roof will do over there but uh, yeah at one point we had to give up and they actually put it uh, uh, they put only the manglo tile roof and then later on they with the first heavy wind coming in they understood that this can't stand in this region it just flew away half of the roof but uh, yeah that is the kind of thing so it's learning from them and making them also understand or value the kind of work they do themselves so that's right. been the yeah uh, we have devalued their own ways of building so much over the years over the decades that uh, i remember our first uh, resort we did in a village uh, and we said so how you going to have you know city people coming and living with you so what kind of a uh, experience would you like to give them so he says we must make a proper uh, concrete house for them yeah. because they, uh, we want to treat them well we want even if we are living in a mud house we want to give them all the amenities that we think we would want to have right. <laughs> so so i said but they are wanting to come here for exactly the opposite experience <laughs> and they were very confused about it but finally when one structure was built and they saw that these people are coming in and actually enjoying living in a mud house they started actually bragging about their own mud houses yes. so uh, so you're right uh, so but uh, in the uh, uh, the uh, madhya pradesh tourism project you are going to uh, uh, the people are building their own homes they are going to uh, the uh, expenditure is going to be done by them themselves uh so it's uh, partly so the uh, government is looking at giving them some kind of a subsidy and the uh, ngos which are working or they are the psos over there so they are trying to identify these people and they are also in talks with other agencies if they can fund it partly but uh, in a way having some sort of an investment uh, if not the physical labor but at least some amount of money going in from their side it gives them that sense of ownership to that place because uh, in many a cases we have seen structures which were built under one of these uh, uh, the schemes what government rolls out and people have just stuffed in hay over there the grass for fodder and they're not living there so having these kind of investment coming from their side probably give them that uh, understanding that this is their own space so yeah it's partly self funded and partly the government is subsidizing it so uh, this is a larger question for the entire team which is because you've got such uh, varied experience from small homes to big homes to working on all the services around it about now you're going into the peri urban looking at farms uh, uh living uh, 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 you know trying to redefine the way urban growth needs to happen so what would be your three good recommendations or uh, predictions of the future of growth of cities especially this pandemic has also made people re uh, question the way cities are growing and whether they are really healthy places to be in so uh, uh, your experience is very valuable in being able to give uh, give a direction to uh, how bangalore or uh, the peri urban of bangalore should grow what would be your three big recommendations if you had to give them thanks to you Uh, if I, if i could uh, say sandeep one of the big challenges around the pandemic itself was this issue of water right it 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 became clear that you needed water for washing hands for example and therefore primarily and then what happens to the waste water 
does it have covid or not what do you do with it so and at the rural regional scale when we were there too water is emerging as a huge concern as a huge challenge because you are groundwater dependent you don't have any access to public utility networks then the second challenge is what do you do with the waste water even in uh, as anurag was speaking these areas there's no clear cut direction as to how we design systems by which that waste water perhaps can be used as a resource itself right so i think we'll have to start to think about our habitats differently we'll have to talk about uh, talk about uh, what space is required for an individual so one of the lessons we have from our uh, uh, interventions in bangalore is that if you have a 40 square meter land area per person 40 square meter then you can be water sufficient you can be energy sufficient with solar energy you can be food sufficient you can grow your own food you can be waste sufficient the land can absorb all the waste streams that we generate from our kitchens from our toilets and then finally it can be biodiversity sufficient you can design so that biodiversity is enhanced just so 40 square, just 40 square meters yes 40 square meter so uh, at a minimum of 20 square meter you can do a basic lively uh, a lifeline one at 40 square meter it's actually abundance right uh, uh, we're talking about abundance at 40 square meter in the bangalore condition so we can start to arrive at design parameters for individuals based on the response um, like you pointed out of the pandemic itself but about urbanization itself as to how we should uh, deal with urbanization what should we do with the resource that we need as sharad rightly showed you no can be mine or construction debris for construction can we be benign with sand mining for example can we be benign with our area footprint around uh, 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 all these lines and then what do we do with the waste streams we are creating mountains of solid waste we are creating rivers which are full of uh, waste and as shubha showed you in a gated community even individual house and even at a watershed level we can design so that our waste is reused right and completely reused and recycled so we'll have to uh, think along the lines of sustainability as a circular economy as being wise from an individual house to the whole city so shubha would you say that uh, uh, the way you are looking at watersheds in the peri urban can the city itself of bangalore be looked as a uh, looked at as a watershed uh, you have to... you're muted you're muted shubha you're muted okay yeah yes the city also can be looked at as a watershed often what happens is we look at it in terms of the administrative boundaries like you are either looking at the boundary of a community or a ward um, or even otherwise larger you looking at it as a district but if you really look at it it is watersheds of course in a city the watersheds and the water flows are a lot broken but uh, we did try out um, so the same the community that i spoke to you about it's in the southeastern part of bangalore in the periphery and it's part of a larger watershed on 33 square kilometers it's it's part of the watershed of the dakshin pinakini river and which has about 15 lakes in the area and there are streams that connect them of course it's all broken there is a ring road there are big apartments and uh, but you still see the water flows during a flood and what we could establish to a certain so what we really tried in in that area was to map the aquifer in a participatory way so we wanted citizen participation to understand the aquifer in those watersheds so the 33 square kilometers itself was in turn made up of eight micro watersheds we looked at that as well Uh, but what we saw is that there are patterns in the watershed even though it's urbanized there are a bunch of best practices that can be followed to keep the water balance in that particular region so simply to answer yes it can be done and uh, i will probably share a small screenshot as well so in an urban area how do you get citizens to come together to participatorily not only map but understand and manage their watershed better so you want to share that now yeah i'll try i'll bring it up it's uh, yeah you all you can probably continue but i'll just bring that up on the screen yeah. because my next question is also again to you okay uh, you know our experience was that local water is actually becoming more expensive than external water that's the way the whole pricing mechanism is uh, that if i was to in gujarat try and use narmada waters which is coming from 1000 kilometers away the subsidies and the mechanisms are designed in such a way that uh, it's cheaper for me to uh, pay the the uh, water bills uh, of the municipality than actually have my community or my uh, colony 
make a bore well or make a well with a recharge system and then use that yes so uh, convincing people uh, that uh, using your own water first is better than using external water is becoming a challenge until and unless the pricing policy of the government doesn't change yeah. what is been your experience on this yeah so that's exactly true like what you would say uh, but to our uh, good fortune or misfortune a lot of the people who adopt these best practices are those who do not have access to the municipal water supply itself so those have been the people who've shown maximum interest and stewardness stewardship in terms of adopting these best practices so they've been in the peripheries of the city where the other source of water that was available to them is tanker water that's coming from bore wells the price of which is al- always increasing and in times of scarcity goes up to 200 rupees per 1000 liter and even more so they have been very quick to understand the financial merit in adopting wastewater treatment reuse rainwater harvesting as well within the city it has been driven more by policy and uh, the need to adhere to policy but yes you are right it becomes more difficult because the, uh, the other water that's available to them is at 6 to 8 rupees per 1000 liters and then the slabs move up from there so you can't really show show it to them in terms of economics but when water availability is low and they learn from each other the water quality is so much better and assured so you see a lot of best practices being followed within the city as well of course while i say it it may seem like everybody is obviously everybody isn't and that's why the city does have a water problem but there is improvement and movement in that direction vishwanath you want to add something i uh, just one point uh, sandeep you uh, a citizen in bangalore who consumes 20000 liters of water a month is effectively uh, effectively given a subsidy of 1600 rupees a month that's the subsidy on water and uh, wastewater in this um, so your decentralized system cannot uh, compete with such a subsidy right but even policy makers are unaware of this number so we are lucky because i'm also lucky i sit on this uh, policy making circles too so at every point of time you have to bring it up how long can this last the city utility is broke because it's subsidizing everybody and 40% of its water leaks right so it's unable to extend its infrastructure and therefore creates a problem so subsidies cannot last long and eventually we'll have to reprice water for its ecological cost and this is the problem across all sectors if you see the whole economy has been designed in such a way that the brazilian apples are actually becoming cheaper than the himachal apples or uh, uh, doing organic farming is more expensive than uh, pumping chemicals uh, into your uh, into your soil and uh, somehow the pandemic is making people rethink some of these basic constructs upon which we have built our societies and uh, i think it's a great opportunity and I, the way you all have used your uh, uh, lockdown period so to speak to uh, do your uh, to do your archiving which is always so difficult for practitioners i know who have been always working to actually sit down and do your own archiving but you all have done it so beautifully with those beautiful comic books and uh, the things like that uh, i would really recommend that you all also come up with a vision document for bangalore bangalore actually do uh, 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 actually draw out the watersheds for uh, for bangalore city and put in your recommendations on how waste uh, needs to be used across the city or or all the all your ideas because with your 30 years of experience you owe it to the city now to give them a vision uh, which is beyond the individual homes but at the city scale uh and i'm sure it will be highly appreciated in these times of uh, of rethinking that uh, the, uh, the the nation and the world is actually going through i'll stop here uh if uh, i ask you have any specific ideas that you want to know i'm really enjoying this conversation and uh, you know i just wish that we, we could go on because you know, in many ways uh, and i yeah we guys trying to share yeah yeah please go yeah, yeah no it's okay so this um, yeah so this was also part of the comic book so the, this is the uh, watershed that we worked on which is part of the penna river and uh, this is the southeastern part the belandur lake to the northwest is the lake that catches fire and those are the 15 lakes in the watershed so 
yeah i thought i'd just share and of course we got good insights and there's a longer report which speaks of how we went about with it and what we learned which is also available on the site that vishwanath spoke about bengaluru.urbanwaters.in somewhere our imagination is for each city to have its own chennai.urbanwaters.in where you speak of the policies the players the good stories the things that you can learn from for each of the city and like you mentioned perhaps a vision for each city too which is driven by all stakeholders not just the water supply authority but ground water citizens csos everybody yeah thought i just share that but so i wanted to talk to you because architects generally shy away from working with government uh, but uh, you all have done uh, a reasonable amount of work and uh, i don't know whether the architect part of your uh, office has done that or is it water part but uh, uh, what is your experience with the government Vishu, perhaps you can answer that. No, so that's been the interesting thing because the learnings from the ground uh, can be taken there. And this city, for example, has brought in many bylaws which have actually been uh, driven by ground level experience. For example, it's mandatory to do rainwater harvesting. It's mandatory to have meters in every flat. If you have a set of apartments of four, then you have to mandatorily really have. Then you have. Then you have to do. Um, wastewater recycling if it's 20 flats and more it's mandatory to have wastewater recycling groundwater all the bore wells are counted in the city right in the city for example so all these are part of the the group it takes a lot of patience but it's possible to work with the government to nudge it towards better policies and better bylaws right? it, it takes a certain way of uh, dialoguing with we've been again very lucky with the city because this city keeps its doors open to listening to civil society all the institutions even the politicians keep their doors open and never have we been rejected and said no no every time the ideas have been considered and then they will mull over it it takes time but then it goes ahead sorry one uh, small technical point that i uh, wanted to uh, ask you about which got missed out in the earlier uh, this thing was the recharge bore wells Uh, there has been a lot of discussion going on about uh, whether we are putting pollutants of the city back into the groundwater through this system what is your experience been on that so so what we say is that if you are the user of the waters that you recharge you have a stake in keeping it clean right so you recharge your well and you reuse the water for your own consumption and then you get an idea of what is the quality of water that needs to be put in same with your bore well so somewhere we have to build the citizens ability not to treat him like a child or infantilize the citizens of our of our place not to expect that the government will uh, be able to take care of uh, pollution and control so building citizenship is at the heart of of uh, our intervention and we have not found a problem at all in fact the well diggers have been sorting out problems when manholes have been leaking and polluting wells or surface runoff has been polluting wells well diggers themselves try and clean it up and repair the manholes so that the well gets cleaner right so it's not rain water which is going to pollute our ground water it's unmanaged solid waste and unmanaged sewage so have you all had the opportunity to work with the ward committees to uh, look at uh, work with the councillors and see how your ward can be redesigned or reworked to bring in a lot of these decentralized principles uh that's been uh, something of a missing uh, gap because the ward committees themselves are dysfunctional in bangalore there's a lot of attempt made to functionalize them and the last mayor tried her best to do it but it doesn't last long and if you don't have a steady ward committee and you know, then it becomes difficult to work with them but that mm-hmm. would be the ideal space to put all these ideas in yeah yeah yeah, yeah. very nice very inspiring i'm i'm going to come and spend a lot more time in your office next time i'm in Yes, I as over to you. Thank you, thank you, Sandeep, by so much. I think, uh, as I said, you know, I, I have sat back and really enjoyed the conversation. And in in many ways, today's uh, uh, presentation by the biome uh, it it started with that uh, residence that was inspired from the Laurie Baker technology, and you could see in presentation after presentation. the 30 years of evolution that biome has actually gone through and with the each successive stage a new dimension has been added to to the practice and in many ways it reminded me to your presentation in which you had similarly shared your 30 years of you know uh, evolution starting from the sir jeevan and then the hunarshala 
and and that's precisely the reason why i could you know there is so much synergy that has been in this discussion that took place i don't know i think many of the questions that has been already discussed i'm not going to you know raise further questions i'm i just uh, uh, want to share a couple of things that i have actually observed and learned actually in from the series and particularly also from this discussion and the more and more we go on talking to people we realize that architectural object is just one of the things that you know that matters when we talk about the sustainable uh, practice in terms of uh, built habitats and uh, the kind of a diverse team that has actually gathered uh, uh, in in biome starting from architects uh, then the engineers then we have the people working with the uh, uh, geologists the hydrologists and only when you start looking at architectural product as 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 uh, as something that is rooted in the larger ecological setup you know the discussion on the sustainability makes much more sense and that is something that is really beautifully you know been demonstrated in in the biomes approach and i'm really really uh, it's been very inspiring and in many ways it reminds me to your sandeep by your uh, your presentation as well so i would actually like to uh, conclude the talk here with uh, with a with a big thank you uh, to first of all to begin with uh, the biome team thank you chitra thank you vishwanath thank you sharad anurag and also shobha it was it was really really inspiring uh, presentation from all of you and uh, in the end i would like to thank uh, sandeep bhai also the questions the insights that you Uh, generated i think only you could have uh, you know uh, 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 raised those those discussions i'm really really uh, thankful to you thank you to all of you for that uh, thank you ayaz and thank you for being for something so different and i think and thank you sandeep because it really the, the discussions were so different from the usual Can this happen in a city? Can it be a tall building, etc.? And we moved beyond that, and we looked at ecosystems and the city very differently. So thank you. Uh, thank you for calling me for uh, doing this. I really enjoyed talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely for me. Yeah. So uh, I would like to sort of conclude the talk here for the audience that uh, this was our last interview in our ongoing series. this was the ninth interview and i am really really glad that we could conclude this interview with the biomes interview because in uh, you know in all our all our earlier interviews uh, there have been different approaches as we talked about when we talk about the sustainability in terms of uh, uh, built environment and uh, in biomes approach we have seen almost they have touched upon all those aspects different aspects they have not only the built environment as we discussed the issues on the water on the ecology on the soil retaining uh, uh, so there have participatory design approaches and in this discussion we have sort of you know concluded uh, the series in a in a much more fantastic way I, it couldn't have been a better uh, than this so we are going to conclude our series here you can um, uh, you can if you want to look at all the previous videos you can go to the our youtube channel they are all there uh, in the shades of green you can also see sandeep bhai's interview it's also there and very shortly we will also be uploading the biomes interview also on our youtube channel we also do publish uh, a gist of this interview in the form of article and those articles are also published on our website so if you visit on our website archidiaries.com you can see all the previous interviews that have been published in the form of uh, articles and we hope to publish this interview also very soon in the form of an article and uh, we hope to see you uh, soon with maybe some other series some other topic and uh, with some other fantastic guests so thank you thanks to, mm -hmm. so much to all of you for joining with us and giving your value time thank you bye bye, bye. thanks <laughs>